Let me begin with this quote from the prophet Isaiah. Hear ye now, O house of David, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. To my fellow Catholics and Christians out there, does this sound familiar? It sounds like Isaiah is predicting the birth of Jesus. Or is he? How's it going everyone? This is Matt Lemire here. I hope all of you guys are having a wonderful day and welcome to my new podcast series, A Chat with Matt, where I take the time to discuss a topic of interest with you guys, the viewers. At the end of this video, please feel free to sound off in the comments section down below if there are any future topics that you want me to cover. So in today's video, we're going to be diving into the Hebrew Bible, also known as the Old Testament, and determine if Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 was in fact predicting the birth of Jesus Christ. Before I go on, I do want to say that I am not trying to infringe upon anyone's religious beliefs, nor am I trying to convert the viewers. The mere purpose of this video is to explain Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 from a more scholarly perspective. So without further ado, let's get started. There are some Christians, predominantly Catholic, though not all, who believe that when reading the passage from Isaiah, that he is explicitly referring to the birth of Jesus Christ in particular. However, there is evidence that suggests that this may not be the case. If we take the events of the Hebrew Bible alone into consideration and disregard the New Testament, we can get a better idea of the geopolitical setting of ancient Israel at the time of Isaiah 7.14. First, let's rewind to the events of what is called the Deuteronomistic History. These are the events of the books of Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings. We will also refer to 2nd Chronicles and the book of the prophet Isaiah. We will begin in the span of the years 734 to 733 BC. During this period in ancient Israel, the nation was divided into two kingdoms, Israel, also known as Ephraim, and Judah, and were the northern and southern kingdoms respectively. Both kingdoms were in the middle of what was known as the syro ephraimite War, where Ephraim had aligned itself with its northern neighbor, Syria, in order to counteract Assyria, one of the major superpowers of the ancient Near East at its time. The war had originally started after an invitation to the coalition was declined by Ahaz, who was king of Judah at this time, as he knew that the coalition would not be formidable enough to overcome the Assyrian army. Now Pekah and Rezin, the kings of Ephraim and Syria respectively, had devised a plan to overthrow Ahaz and place a puppet king in his place that would force Judah to join the coalition. When Ahaz received word of their coup d'etat, he went to the Assyrian king himself, Tiglath Pileser III, to ask him to get rid of Syria and Ephraim. When Rezin and his Syrian troops began their advance on Judah with the help from Pekah and Ephraim, Judean intelligence informed the house of David in Jerusalem of their imminent attack. Simultaneously, the prophet Isaiah and his son, Sher Yashuv, met with Ahaz in person to encourage him to trust in the Lord and to have nothing to fear. Now Ahaz was known for being a politically smart king, but he was not necessarily the most pious of individuals. Isaiah also had revealed the exact plot of the syro ephraimite confederacy to the king, and foresaw that Ephraim would fall in 65 years to the Assyrian army. He warned Ahaz that if the latter did not place his trust in God, the Lord will remove him from his throne, and reminded him of the promise God made to David, that one of David's sons or descendants would take the throne forever. Now did Ahaz listen to Isaiah's warning? Well, he didn't. God had demanded Ahaz to ask a sign for himself from the former. Ahaz responded in scriptural language, saying that he wouldn't listen to God, arguing that only when he saw the sign from God himself, then he would reaffirm his faith. At this point, we reach the moment where Isaiah gave the prophecy that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Isaiah pointed out to Ahaz that the child Emmanuel, meaning God is with us, would be sinless in nature in that he would choose good over evil. Isaiah also warned Ahaz again this time not to trust Pileser, who had now conquered Babylon and had made plans to conquer Jerusalem and all of Judah as well. Ahaz, feeling confused and betrayed, fashioned an unholy altar and made sacrifices to God in a desperate attempt to stop Pileser. In 727 BC, Ahaz would die. But now the noteworthy part of this story comes after Ahaz's death. 
as Hezekiah, Ahaz's son, would ascend to the throne and would undo many of his father's own policies, such as reinstituting Passover and biblical worship in the temple, both of which were banned by his father, and in the process, he would also ban idolatry. In doing so, he had restored the Judean people's faith. As years passed by during Hezekiah's reign, the Assyrians would continue to deal blow after blow to Judah, leveling the country to the ground. However, because of Hezekiah's incredibly pious faith, both the house of David and Jerusalem would be spared the judgment of God. Gordon Franz, Master of Associates of the Associates of Biblical Research, in his article, The Ultimate Sign, Isaiah Chapter 7, argues that the Emmanuel of Isaiah's prophecy by occurrence of events is in fact Ahaz's son, Hezekiah, as he would be the one who could and eventually would save the house of David and Jerusalem amidst the threat of Assyria and Judah's other enemies. Given the proximity of Isaiah's prophecy to Hezekiah and the permanent impact of his reign in Judah, it becomes more reasonable to conclude that Isaiah was not necessarily looking into the far future for a savior of Judah or even all of Israel. Rather, he was merely trying to convince Ahaz to renew his faith in God, and if the king did not do so, then a successor would claim it, that successor being his son, and he would be able to avert the threat of enemy kings. Another article found in the Washington Post, written by Daniel Burke of the Religious News Service, suggests that the prophecy served as a biological clock for the house of David, and is not necessarily referring to one single person. He notes that Isaiah is essentially saying that in the time it takes for a young boy to mature, Judah's enemies, including Assyria, would fall. Since Emmanuel does in fact translate to God is with us, Isaiah could be saying that if the people of Judah continue to remain faithful to God, the latter will deliver his justice to their enemies over the course of time. And there you go, we've essentially proved that Isaiah was not predicting the birth of Jesus. That's the end of the video, right? Well, not just yet. We have to continue our investigation to genuinely show Isaiah was not talking about Jesus. With that being said, where else can we look to find evidence to substantiate this claim? Well, it's actually pretty easy. We can just look at the original Hebrew text. Language is very important, as it provides context for what the speaker is talking about. This is key for understanding the implications of many of the prophecies given in the Hebrew scriptures, and it is just as prominent here in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14. Earlier I mentioned that many of the Catholics and Christians have believed that Isaiah's prophecy concerns the birth of a child from a virgin woman. According to the Tanakh though, this is not true at all. The Tanakh refers to the Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Essentially, this is the Hebrew Bible. The mistranslation used by Christians stems from the original Greek translation of the Tanakh, called the Septuagint, as the Gospel of Matthew refers to Isaiah 7.14 based on this version of the Tanakh. In Matthew chapter 1 verses 18-25, through 25, Christ's conception is described as a miraculous virgin birth through the Holy Spirit. The Annunciation follows where the Gospel alludes to Isaiah's prophecy as the angel Gabriel tells Joseph that his wife Mary is pregnant without intercourse and that he must accept her pregnancy. Gabriel notes that their newborn son is the literal Emmanuel of Isaiah's prophecy, who will be able to differentiate between moral good and evil. The problem here is not Jesus' connection to the prophecy. It is the consequent assumption made by Christians today that Isaiah had predicted Christ's virgin birth in the first place, emphasis on the word virgin. Rabbi Bensian Kravitz, in his article, Isaiah 714, A Virgin Birth, notes that in the Tanakh, the word used in Hebrew to describe the woman in the prophecy was Alma, which translates to young woman, not virgin. However, when the Tanakh was translated into Greek for the Septuagint, its meaning changed to virgin, which is the reason why this assumption was made in the first place. Kravitz refers to the story of Cain and Abel to demonstrate that the same verbs used to describe natural birth in Cain and Abel such as hara, meaning conceived, and yoledet, meaning will give birth, were also used in Isaiah 7.14. Some Bibles, such as the New Revised Standard Version, have recognized this mistranslation and have inserted young woman in the place of virgin. And I can testify to that, as the Bible I use in my religious studies class, the New Oxford Annotated Bible, does use the description of young woman in Isaiah 7.14. 
Now it becomes more apparent that the prophecy of Isaiah was not referring to a virgin birth at all. And the quote I put up at the beginning of the video should now read this instead. Different meaning, right? So, we have looked at the historical events surrounding Isaiah's prophecy, and we have looked at the words specifically used in the Tanakh to verify that Isaiah, in chapter 7, verse 14, was not talking about Jesus. Rather, he was analyzing the bleak state of uncertainty for Judah with the threat of Assyria and other nations, and in the process, was trying to encourage the king, Ahaz, to renew his faith in God. And that concludes today's video. This was my first kind of podcast sort of video, so please let me know what you guys think down in the comments section below. And as I mentioned earlier, please feel free to suggest any topics that you want me to cover in future videos. And as always, to get more content like this, remember to tune in same map time, same map channel. Thank you for watching, guys, and take care.